Okay, we are live, and we'll get started here in just a second. Let me put a little Twitter post up. And you guys feel free to share this on your ends, too, once you see it come out. Should be popping up here any second. This is what happens when you have two computers and a phone running at the same time. <laughs> there we go. Yep, it's live. Okay. And Marissa, I'm going to put you into the stream. You're not going to be on screen just yet, um, but you are on deck to start. Okay. And it looks like Eric's already watching too, so <laughs> watching your poster presentation. That's good. I think he's taking credit for the title, but I'm not sure. Marissa, we'll see. <laughs> he definitely is. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get started. Welcome to the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, Regional Anesthesia and Pain Podcast as a wrap. I'm your host, Raj Gupta, coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. Well, we are on our sixth day of presenting posters for the American Society of Anesthesia, Regional Anesthesia 2020 spring meeting that never really happened. So the meeting got canceled, but we had all these wonderful posters, so we thought we'd share them with you. And we had a great time last week, really good response every day. We had almost 1,000 viewers every day for the shows um, last week uh, within 24 hours. And the response was so good, we realized there was one big topic we left out that's a prominent topic at the spring meeting these days, and that's point-of-care ultrasound. So we wanted to make sure we included the abstracts for point-of-care ultrasound, and we have a tremendous group of people to um, present this, uh, these topics with and moderate it. Um, but more importantly, we have uh, six of our posters are going to be presented by some of the authors of the posters, which is really great because they didn't get a chance to present the posters at the meeting this year. Um, we're going to have all of them up here in just a second. Let me get the team up here on the screen. So, hello. I'm going to just have everybody wave. They can see your names at the bottom. I'm going to unhide this little dongle so they can see Steve's name, too. Um, and if you guys are watching, put comments in your comment area, and I will see those up here and include them when we get to that part of the conversation. Um, we're going to start with our first poster presentation here in just a second. We've got lots of really good content, so we're going to kind of stay on a tight timeline. I'll include the other authors as we go, um, and, uh, but I think it'll be a wonderful session. Um, one quick note for those of you guys, uh, while the author is presenting, try to mute your microphone just so we reduce the background noise. And then uh, when we get to the Q&A, we can open up those mics. Okay, Marissa Weber is our first presenter, and she is going to be presenting poster number 806. And I will, uh, for those of you guys who are watching, I'm going to put the link in the comments field so you can follow along with the poster. And her, uh, this poster is titled Pulp Fiction, a point of care gastric ultrasound analysis of the gastric emptying time of orange juice with and without pulp. So no comments about which you prefer, but Marissa, go for it. You're starting out today. All righty. Good afternoon. My name is Marissa Weber. I'm a CA3 at Thomas Jefferson University. And we again did look at the presence of pulp and orange juice and whether that did affect gastric emptying time. As uh, our poster seems to indicate, uh, this is indeed um, a myth. So just a little bit, bit of background information about fasting guidelines. So they've existed since the 1800s after a number of post-operative deaths were linked to intra-op aspiration. And as we're all aware, as anesthesiologists, induction is one of the most dangerous times in the anesthetic course. And um, the Royal College of Anesthetists actually remarked that 50% of deaths related to airway complications were actually linked to aspiration. So in terms of our current fasting guidelines, these have been put together after, after years of expert guidance, and they're as follows, two hours for clear liquids, four hours for breast milk, 
six for non-clear liquids like milk and orange juice with pulp, and eight for large fatty meals. Again, this is based off expert opinion, not necessarily based off science. And in fact, it was shown when Van, um, Van de Put showed with his colleagues that 6.2% of patients showing up for elective surgery had um, had stomach contents that were not consistent with a fasted state. So even if people do follow these, these guidelines appropriately, that still is not a guarantee that they will not have an aspiration event intra-op. So in terms of the six hour window, this uh, Hilliard and his colleagues in the UK did address whether adding milk, a, uh, a liquid that is considered to, uh, to require a six hour fasting window to tea would increase gastric emptying time. And they found that there was no change in patients, subjects who drank tea with and without milk. So we were curious if the same applied to another one of the beverages that fits into that category, mainly orange juice with and without pulp. So in terms of our study, we recruited medical students from Thomas Jefferson University. We started with 13 medical students. You can see their demographics on the table in the bottom left of our poster. They, as you can tell, were young by and large, um, with, and they were otherwise healthy with BMIs of 22. So a little bit of information on gastric point of care ultrasound. They, um, we used the curvilinear probe to assess um, um, for, the, for gastric point of care ultrasound in the right lateral decubitus position. We found the gastric antrum by looking at the aorta and the SMA. And from there, you could assess the uh, the stomach itself. It, there's, it's said to have a bullseye appearance, and we were able to qualitatively assess it, look at whether the stomach appeared to have anything in the contents. And you can see what a pic what that would look like. There's a picture on the top right of the fasted stomach. So you see that bullseye, and you can looking at the stomach can see that it doesn't really look like there's any any contents. And you can also measure the gastric cross-sectional area as a quantitative way of assessing gastric volume. And um, for, for uh, what's kind of been determined is less than 1.5 milliliters per kilogram is consistent with a fasted state because there are normal gastric secretions that will um, be in the stomach. So again, we recruited 13 medical students. They arrived after fasting for eight hours. They underwent a preliminary screening, which ensured that they were indeed fasted. So we evaluated their gastric cross-sectional area and took pictures that would be evaluated by a blinded observer. They then drank 11 and a half ounces of orange juice with and without pulp. And a timer was set for 120 minutes. After that time was up, they were rescanned. Pictures were taken and the cross-sectional area was measured. These were again evaluated by our independent observer. And you can see these pictures at the top right um, again. So in terms of our results, we started with 13 patients, three were removed, two because of difficult anatomy, one because they had a pre, um, a pre orange juice scan. So their initial scan in the morning when they were supposed to be fasted uh, with a gastric volume greater than 1.5 milliliters per kilogram. So not consistent with a fasted state. And again, these images were evaluated before and afterwards. And as our table, um, as our data showed, excuse me, um, before and after the gastric volumes for these 10 patients were less than 1.5 mill milliliters per kilogram, again, showing no change in gastric emptying after drinking orange juice with and without pulp. So just in general, our, as we kind of discussed at the beginning, a lot of these guidelines we use have been reassuring to us. They were developed by expert opinion, but they are just one tool we've developed to help uh, to help manage the aspiration risk that is associated with the general anesthetic. But with the development of ultrasound, we're able to hone in more on what appropriate guidelines really should be. And as our study seems to indicate, and other studies have indicated, beverages like milk, beverages like orange juice with, with pulp do not necessarily require the full six hour 
fasting guidelines. And these, an orange juice with pulp should be treated like a clear liquid. Thank you, Marissa. That was excellent. Um, I'm going to give uh, first dibs to this uh, Q&A session to a co-author of yours, Dr. Haskins. Steve, you want to uh, comment anything or ask a question? Uh, I assume that you know most of the answers to the questions, but you can comment first and then we'll move on. And you're still muted, by the way. There you go. Yeah. Uh, well, I was I was fortunate to be asked to participate in this study. I reviewed uh, the images and was one of the people who gave feedback on whether it was empty or inside into uh, whether or not quantitatively uh, there was a significant amount of, of volume in the gastric contents. Uh, I mean, I think what this demonstrates is is uh, you know, that we could probably do countless studies along these lines when it comes to, you know, looking at chicken broth or looking at, you know, other other uh, elements that, that we're always sort of worried about, chewing gum, whatever it may be. Um, but it highlights uh, an important fact, which is when it comes to sort of healthy uh, patients like that with low risk of, of a delayed gastric emptying, um, you know, they're most likely going to, to push things through like these clear liquids. Uh, that it's unlikely that they're going to, you know, be a high risk for, for aspiration. And, and it, 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 again, sort of uh, points out that gastric ultrasound, um, thinking about uh, Rochelle Crystal Brinks and Anahi Perlis's publication in ANA uh, in January back in 2019, which looked at the pretest probability um, of whether or not the stomach is empty or full. And if there is a high pretest probability that the stomach is full, um, or there is a, a low pretest probability that the stomach is full, then the benefit of gastric ultrasound becomes uh, relatively uh, minimal. It's when you find that patient, that true 50-50% chance that they could be empty or full, that patient with diabetic gastroparesis who may still be a, been fasted for eight or 10 hours, or that patient with critical illness, um, that's when it really benefits you because the sensitivity and specificity goes to almost 100% for gastric ultrasound. Um, so so I, I think this is a meaningful study because again it sort of highlights the difference between guidelines and, and clinical reality um, but when it comes to, to utilizing gastric ultrasound um, uh, you don't necessarily need to scan every healthy volunteer that, that comes in who may have had a little bit of pulp um, but it really does make a big difference for those patients where where there's that true 50 50 chance that that they may uh, you know have have residual contents Melissa I'm gonna direct the next one uh, next opening here for you uh, if you have a question for Marissa, but one of the questions I had was uh, related to what Steve was talking about, which is um, uh, how often do you use the gastric ultrasound? Um, is it every patient, every patient with high suspicion? Are, are you guys utilizing it on any kind of regular basis, Melissa? So in my practice, I actually incorporate it quite frequently. I do a lot of high risk endoscopy at least in pre-COVID times. Mm -hmm. And I find that that's actually one of the easiest places for me to incorporate its use because I see a lot of questionable patients coming in that are having EGDs with histories of gastroparesis. Um, and so while not, well, I can't say we are routinely using it, I certainly do use it with this significantly increased frequency um, in that, spe that specific patient population. Any questions for Marissa on her poster? Thanks, Marisa. Did you change your clinical practice based on the study at your place? I think we're starting to. It's just a lot of, I think, it like anything, um, it requires a lot of practitioners being comfortable with doing this. So it's something that our regional team is certainly very comfortable with. Um, and I think it's especially effective for a lot of patients with, as you are saying, questionable NPO status um, and some of our, our, our kind of higher risk patients, but it's, you know, it, it takes time, I think, for everyone to become comfortable with this to the point that it might be something that'd be more widely incorporated. Well, Can I add as someone who's reviewing the images, the, the images from the beginning of the study to the end of the study, there was dramatic improvement in terms of what they were capturing. And I think there was a, a pretty, pretty uh, um, gradual, well, not significant learning curve. They were able to, within, I would say, a few scans, really start getting excellent images. So it speaks to, to the ease of learning gastric ultrasound. Yeah, much like uh, a regional anesthesia, when we were doing ultrasound, the learning curve was pretty steep as far as acquiring images. Um, seems like with uh, point-of-care ultrasound and gastric being one of the more straightforward ones, 
uh, seems to be a very rapid learning curve. Marissa, I want to thank you for joining us and presenting your uh, great work here. And I'm going to actually kick you off. Uh, you, the screen. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome to continue watching just because we have another person trying to log in here. And Rahul, I'm going to get you on here in just a second. Hey, and you are perfect. Welcome, Rahul. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you for joining us and uh, waiting for your presentation. Let me pull up your poster. And for those of you guys who are watching, um, this is point of care ultrasound. Oh, actually, let me start with this way. This is poster number 1041. And I'm going to put the link here in the comments. And I will put your poster up on the screen. There we go. And uh, it's your turn. Go ahead, Rahul. Okay, perfect. Um, so my name is Rahul Guha. I'm an anesthesiologist at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And this is a case where we use point of care ultrasound to diagnose um, or evaluate severe intraoperative hypotension. So just a little bit of background. Um, as we've talked a little bit about already, point of care ultrasound helps you find images in real time, which can help you do things like look at cardiac pathology, pulmonary pathology, gastric emptying. So um, it had a great application for us in this case. Um, so this patient was a 65-year-old female who had a history of hypertension and had multiple lumbar surgeries and had a chronic back pain. So she was having um, another lumbar surgery to take out hardware and to do a lumbar fusion. Um, the start of our case was pretty uneventful. Um, we had an induction with propofol and succinylcholine. Uh, intubation was no problem. Um, they were doing neuromonitoring, so we started propofol and remifentanil infusions. Uh, we placed an arterial line after induction, and then we turned the patient prone, and the surgery started. So really no issues at the start. Um, about two hours into the case, we had a the blood pressure suddenly dropped and went down to about the 40s, 50s systolic and it had been stable throughout before. Um, we um, uh, treated this with um, epinephrine, phenylephrine, lots of vasopressors to try to get the blood pressure back up. The episode lasted probably about two or three minutes, and then um, suddenly the blood pressure stabilized. Um, we had an epinephrine infusion for a little while, but we were able to titrate that off pretty quickly. But we had this case of unexplained hypotension. Um, after discussion with the surgeon, we said that we should try to stop the case as soon as we could so that we could try to work this up further. Um, the surgeons had taken out the hardware, but they hadn't done any of the fusion yet, so they went ahead and just closed the incision, returned the patient back supine, and this was where point of care ultrasound really um, helped us. So we brought the ultrasound into the um, operating room, and we performed a few exams, but one of the things we looked at was the heart using a transthoracic echocardiogram. Um, we tried a few different views, and the best one we had was the subcostal four-chamber view. That's the one where you place the probe on the xiphoid, you angle it towards the left shoulder. Um, and then I've, you can see the images on the bottom here. Um, so the image on the left is the image we had. The one on the right is just there as a reference. Um, but if you look at the image on the left, um, that's the one we had. So you can see that we've labeled the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle. And then in red, we've kind of indicated what we saw as a hyperechoic mobile mass uh, within the right atrium. So um, we presume this to be a cardiac thrombus. And it was really helpful to us to have this image because we had called cardiology and we were able to show them this image. And that really helped expedite care for the patient. Um, we went over to the recovery room with the patient still intubated and cardiology came down right away and they did um, transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiograms. Um, interestingly, they didn't see the intracardiac thrombus. What happened most likely was that the thrombus propagated um, because the patient had a CT uh, done a, a few hours later that showed a, or sorry, a left sided pulmonary emboli that were submassive. So I think this case is a really good highlight of how you can use point of care ultrasound to make diagnoses in real time and expedite care for the patient because this was the only time we saw the cardiac thrombus. And even by the time cardiology got there and did their exam, the thrombus was no longer present. Um, we are, as providers, many of us are very used to using ultrasound perioperatively for things like regional techniques or vascular access. But hopefully by showing cases like this and by continuing to educate, we can um, expand the use of point of care ultrasound in the perioperative setting. Excellent, Rahul. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we actually had 
talked about this poster earlier last week. Um, we didn't have a chance to get you guys on. That's why I wanted to, uh, I was excited to have one of you guys present this. Honestly, most of us, when we started reading this poster, we were trying to figure out how you did the ultrasound prone while the patient was still upside down until we realized that you flipped the patient before right, you did that. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> We'd have to be really skilled to Yeah, to I was wrong. trying to figure that out. Uh, Jan, I'm going to start with you. Um, any any questions about this utilization of cardiac um, transthoracic echo intraoperatively um, for obviously a an acute uh, change in the patient's condition? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's just a, another fantastic example of the power of focus. I mean, I can see, you know, everybody, even if they're not nodding their heads there, you know, <laughs> um, the, the, these are just, you know, it, it's one of those things, you know, where you help guide a patient's therapy and probably save their life. So I just, you know, um, kudos to thinking about it. It's one thing to have the skills, but in the heat of the moment to to act on it, particularly because otherwise you'd be stuck with another case of unexplained hypotension that probably would have found those PEs because it would have been high on the differential. But I mean, that way you were able to expedite and these pa this patient's care and, you know, probably improve it, although you'll never know because you, it's an anecdotal event, hopefully, for you. Hari, any uh, questions about uh, their utilization of uh, POCUS here? Uh, thanks, Rahul. It's a very good case. This is the one which all the viewers and everybody should know. The most common use of POCUS is intraoperative hypotension. The good things in your posture I observed is you did a fast along with the focus of the heart, which is a good thing. Think of the other things as well. And I would also add lung ultrasound. It's really relevant close to that one. So think of adding stuff along with the, And saving the images is really the best option. As you said, if you don't save it, the, the clot may not be seen. And they don't believe what you are, especially when you're doing focus. The other people need to believe what you did because they don't think you are an expert. So saving the images. And this is really a challenging case because the patient is in prone. So this is the most effective clinical use. Incorporate fast lung ultrasound along with the focus. Save the images. That's the, my message. Yes. Really well done. Steve or Melissa, any last questions for Rahul before we move one, on to the next poster? Uh, Rahul, I did have one question. I didn't know, based on what was um, put in the poster, whether you'd noticed any RV dysfunction or if you're able to measure like TAPSI in an apical four chamber? Uh, no, we didn't really um, measure that. We didn't have time to uh, go into that in depth. Um, so yeah, we didn't look for any RV dysfunction or try to specifically evaluate for that. Just yeah, one, I mean, with the concern for the PE, that would have been um, uh, really, I, I wonder if the cardiologist's uh, echo also showed any change. Yeah, they, the RV yeah, they didn't there. really comment on it in their official report either. So, and, and maybe it was present while the thrombus was there and it just disappeared later. Sorry, Steve, I cut you off. No, I just, I just wanted to say very quickly, you know, one of the comments that you made is that you tried multiple views and some were better than others. And when you typically think about diagnosing a PE, it's the apical four chamber view or it's a parasternal short axis where you see that sort of end systolic D shape. Um, but, but, you know, this demonstrates that, you know, if you don't see what you would expect to see with those typical views, keep looking and eventually you, you can typically get some form of information from, from a focused cardiac ultrasound exam. So, so if you don't see something, apical Typically, go to parasternal. If that's not working, then go subcostal. But don't give up. You usually do get meaningful information eventually. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rahul. Um, I'm going to take you off the stream here, but appreciate so much for you coming and presenting your work. Great. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Kwesi, I'm going to uh, have you join in here. Uh, one of our people, I think, is running a few minutes late, so I'm going to skip and have you. Hey, how are you, Kwesi? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, let me jump to your poster here real quick. And this is poster number 1034 uh, for those following along. And I'm about to put the link in the comments field and up on the screen. There you go. And I will try to keep up with zooming in. But uh, if there's some place you want me to point directly at some point, let me know. But otherwise, go ahead and get started. No problem. Um, so it's a, a pleasure to represent my colleagues uh, and our, our team. Uh, my name is Kwesi Kofi. Uh, I'm in uh, Dalhousie University, 
in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I'm a staff anesthesiologist. Um, so I'm, it's my pleasure to present our, our study, which is the, the onset and incidence of diaphragmatic dysfunction after ultrasound guided supraclavicular brachial plexus block uh, perspective observational study. So what we did essentially was we were trying to, um, to examine the kinetics of diaphragm dysfunction uh, as it happens relative to supraclavicular block. Now, a variety of different investigators have looked at the, the incidence before, um, but we were trying to examine in particular a bit of the kinetics. Um, and to do that, we did something that, that hasn't been done before, which is we used the um, recently, recent to, to regional anesthesia um, literature, the ABCDE technique, or the zone of apposition method for assessing diaphragmatic dysfunction. And uh, this method has a few advantages over uh, previous um, uh, methods that have been used to investigate this. So as many of you know, there's been a variety of, of studies that have looked at diaphragmatic dysfunction related to brachial plexus blocks. In particular, um, several years ago, there was you know a, a dozen or so um, investigations of interscaling block with different volumes and up-down studies. And a lot of them used ultrasound most of them use the subcostal approach, so visualizing the diaphragm using the either the liver or the spleen as a window to visualize the diaphragm moving down towards the ultrasound. Now, this has a couple of disadvantages. Um, one is that um, most um, authors uh, excluded uh, left-sided surgeries when they did this because the, the window to be able to visualize on the left-hand side through the spleen uh, is is often imperfect, and it can be difficult even on the right side, particularly in obese patients. Um, also, a lot of investigators used a comparative technique where they actually did a, a visualization before and looked at the movement and compared that movement to the visualization after, which is not what we did visualize before and after, but the measurements are actually independent. So our decision is made based on a single um, uh, visualization. So instead of looking for the movement of the diaphragm, what we're looking for is the thickening of the diaphragm. All muscles, when they contract actively, they thicken. So that's what we're measuring. So diaphragmatic dysfunction is determined by having less than 20% thickening of the muscle visualized in the zone of apposition in the lateral chest, which is easy to do on either side in patients and regardless of their body habitus. Um, so what we did, this was an observational study. We took 30 patients um, and we did supraclavicular block. We did a double injection technique where we put half of the local in the corner pocket and we put half of the local above the area that would be sort of superior trunk um, or the, um, the anterior posterior um, divisions of the superior trunk um, deep to the prevertebral fascia. And we put half the local there. Um, and then we did um, diaphragm uh, assessments um, uh, at baseline, and then at five minutes up till 30 minutes, uh, and then we did a uh, post-operative scan. And what we found was that, was, um, that the, the kinetics were, uh, you know, that the, the mean um, for onset was about 15 minutes, which, which wasn't a huge surprise. The thing that was a huge surprise was incidentally, um, the um, the incidence that we found of diaphragmatic dysfunction was much higher than has been previously described um, and was 80%. 80 um, most of these patients had onset of their diaphragmatic dysfunction within the first 30 minutes with the exception of a single patient who actually was diagnosed in the, in the post-operative um, period. We looked at um, breathlessness based on the, the Borg dyspnea scale um, and very few patients had dyspnea there was one patient who had um, reported significant dyspnea, um, five on 10 on the, the Borg dyspnea scale, which is you know, severe dyspnea, um, but this patient had a BMI of 42 um, and their dyspnea didn't require any treatment, some reassurance, um, and it resolved, they didn't need any support and they were discharged home um, without any incidents. Um, there were four other patients that had dyspnea, um, one that had one out of 10, and then three patients that had uh, 0.5 out of 10 of dyspnea, so very mild dyspnea. Um, so in the end, what we saw was um, one that potentially um, diaphragmatic dysfunction after supraclavicular block is potentially more common than, than we thought it was. 
um, and um, also that the onset is 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 largely uh, quite quick, but but can be um, occasionally delayed. So it's something that you don't want to um, miss, and it it makes us question the 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 relative advantages of um, of supraclavicular block for, for example, shoulder surgery, um, when an scaling block might be used if the incidence is that high. Um, the caveat I will say that a lot of other um, studies that have looked at supraclavicular technique have not specifically identified exactly what technique um, that they used when they did a supraclavicular block and have left it up to you know whoever was conducting the block. We didn't, we controlled for that, um, and that may have had impact on the on the on the incidence. Excellent. Thank you, I'm Quizzy. Um, happy to take any questions. Yeah, I'm going to start with Hari because Hari, when we talked about a few posters last week with uh, questions about diaphragmatic uh, involvement from different uh, interscaling supraclavicular blocks, you had a lot of questions in the comments and stuff like that. So I thought you'd be a good person to start um, and asking about this technique. Thanks, Quizzy. Uh, this, I like this technique. It's easy to get the acoustic windows. So based on your experience, because you know you teach and you do a lot, which of the following, like the subcostal or the diaphragmatic movement, measuring the space, or this one, which has the highest sensitivity and specificity, which do you think we need to propose for people if they are looking for the hemidiaphragmatic paresis? So, so both have been, um, both, are, both are validated, and there's no question that the, the ABCDE technique is dramatically easier to do it's independent of body habitus. Um, the measurements that you take don't require a, a preoperative uh, measurement, so you don't need to know the pre-status. You can do a single scan. So if you're in a clinical situation where you're trying to assess di diaphragmatic dysfunction, as I said before, you don't need to have a previous assessment to be able to do that. You can just look for the thickening. Um, so, and because you can do it on both sides, because it's independent of body habitus, um, to me, it it makes a, the technique wildly better. It's easy to learn. Uh, you know, I, I teach medical students and residents to 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 do this technique in in a, a fifteen minute session, and and they can acquire them very quickly. Melissa, any questions uh, for Quasi on this? Um, I was just wondering, and I think a few of the people in the comments section have mentioned the higher volume of thirty mLs. Uh, rope became is this standard practice or was this something just decided upon for this study? No, I, I think it's a pretty typical volume, you know, somewhere between, you know, 25 and 30 cc's in a supraclavicular space, I don't think is, um, is a, you know, a particularly high volume. Could you do a, a lower volume technique? Absolutely, it's possible. I think as your volume gets gets lower, um, then of course your failure rate's gonna increase. In particular, in this study, we didn't leave it up to the individual practitioners. So normally clinically when I'm doing a block, I don't really have a fixed volume that I'm trying to give. I really um, administer whatever local I think is required to be able to accomplish and sort of, sort of fill up the space. And you know what? Maybe that'll be 15 mils and maybe it'll be 30 mils depending on, 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 on what I see. Um, but we didn't leave that up to the because we wanted to control for that. We didn't leave it up to the practitioner, so we had a fixed we had a fixed volume, and that might be a limitation. We had an interesting conversation last week on one of the posters presented, and they showed that they noticed diaphragm dysfunction down to five mLs. So you know, trying to cut the volume down may not help us as much as we think we're uh, saving the patient's diaphragmatic function that at any volume, you're pretty much guaranteed to get a high rate of diaphragmatic dysfunction anyway. And so the conversations about 10 or 12 mLs for the supraclavicular block may not be as sparing as uh, we, we would like to think it is. Um, Jan, uh, last question. Uh, any question for Quasi here? Oh, then Steve, we'll, we'll do a quick one there. Uh, no, I just uh, was curious if you differentiated between diaphragmatic dysfunction and diaphragmatic paresis, because I think that uh, particularly when we did our uh, superior trunk block uh, study comparing that to um, to an uh, inner scaling block, we saw that there was some dysfunction, but not always paresis, and I think that that can make a big difference clinically for, for certain patients. So it's a, that's a great question. Using this method, uh, paresis, and, paresis and dysfunction has not been um, defined. So usually, when you're when you're defining paresis, uh, paresis and 
complete paralysis and, and sort of a lot of studies refer to as sort of partial paralysis. Um, they look for, you know, paradoxical movement instead of, instead of having sort of, sort of normal dropping of the diaphragm, you know, as evidence of complete paresis. Um, of course, with this technique, we're not looking at movement, we're looking at thickening. Um, so, you know, normally when you have a very, a normal diaphragm, often you can see that the thickness is, you know, it's almost double, it doubles its thickness when it's, when it's normal, but we don't have a, a definition. We use a, a sort of a firm definition, which was, which was 20% anything less than 20% thickening. So we, we didn't have a, I don't, I'm not sure what the other definition we would use. Yeah, and you have a quick question or comment? No, I mean, that, I mean, that was gonna be my, my, my question too, right? Cause I mean, this dysfunction 80%, you know, like is, is a lot, was, was a lot higher than what we so were always hoping for. And particularly in light of the HSS that it seemed was involved with, um, it was so like surprising, which, you know, works well to confirm my own bias towards the superior truncal block, but I mean, we need to, um, in, the, in the interest of science, we need to work on like a definition and also validation of the ABCD E technique versus the, the other standard methods. Just as far as the, you know, the diaphragmatic paresis element, sorry to drag this on, okay. <laughs> but no. definitely with the paradoxical movement with with the subcostal sort of sniff test, that's that's one way, one way to confirm essentially paresis versus dysfunction. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure Ben Su did publish something with ABCDE technique demonstrating that um, that pr maybe with the sniff there is some sort of uh, uh, movement of the of the diaphragm that can suggest paresis versus dysfunction I I, I don't know the details um, but uh, but something for for future discussion That's I think it. he's talked about it but I don't think there's been any validation of it I think it's been postulated um, but 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 there's been no validation of it so it, I, I think it's certainly interesting uh, to look at but um, but I, I, I still think that, you know, the, you know, the big advantage of this is we can get a clear measurement in, in all patients. And, and, you know, you can argue about whether or not it's complete paresis or whether it's partial, but it's, it's significant. Um, so, and, it, and it's easy to do and reliable regardless of body habitus and regardless of laterality. So I think that's a huge advantage. At least Thanks, in my practice, I use it routinely. Thank you, Quasi. I'm so glad you were able to join us to present this work. Uh, thank I you. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna. Oh, get thanks so next, much for having us. Yeah, I'm gonna get the next uh, author on here, um, and I uh, hope to see you again in person soon. I'm gonna pull Julie Holroyd up in here. Hey, Julie, how are you? Hey, good. How are yeah, you? Let me get your poster up. This is poster 981 for those of you following along, and I'm gonna put the link up here and get it up on the screen. So this is aggressive fluid resuscitation and increased capillary leakage leads to false positive fast. Um, so I will let you take this away, Julie, go for it. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, so hi, my name is Julie Holroyd. I'm a CA2 resident at the University of Florida, and I'll be presenting the case of a patient with a false positive FAST exam for intra-abdominal bleeding, where further workup with a CT scan did not demonstrate active bleeding. Um, so this was a 39-year-old female who required emergent hysterectomy after delayed uterine atony following an uncomplicated vaginal delivery. Um, and point-of-care ultrasound was available in used in this case to help determine the cause of hemodynamic instability. Um, so this patient lost three and a half liters of blood and was resuscitated with two liters of crystalloid, one liter of albumin, and multiple blood products. And she was hemodynamically stable on emergence. Um, so she went to the PACU postoperatively and anesthesia acute pain service was called to place continuous tap blocks to help with pain control. Um, but during the placement, she became hypotensive and tachycardic uh, with downtrending uh, hematocrit and platelets. And since ultrasound was available, they had just used it for the tap blocks. They went ahead and did a TTE and a FAST exam. Um, the TTE showed hypovolemia and the FAST was positive for free fluid. Um, so at this point, the surgical team was notified for possible uh, re-exploration, um, but prior to um, going back to the operating room, they went ahead and got a CT scan, which showed hemoperitoneum without 
without active bleeding. So we can see on the picture on the bottom right, um, the blood surrounding the patient's liver there. Um, so she was actually diagnosed with DIC um, and resuscitated with additional blood products. And she did start to improve um, and serial fast exams remained stable as well. Um, so what's interesting about this case um, is that the positive fast exam could have led to multiple different treatment options, you know, um, it, given in the context of um, the hemodynamic instability and the downtrending lab values, you know, this could have necessitated a return to the operating room for surgical correction of bleeding or this could have represented a normal post-operative finding after major abdominal surgery with large volume fluid resuscitation. Um, so, you know, ultrasound's very quick, useful tool for anesthesiologists, has excellent specificity up to 99%, um, which it's important to remember that this is studied in trauma bay patients. So when a patient comes into the trauma trauma bay and has a positive fast, they just bypass the CT scanner and go straight to the operating room. Um, so this was a different sort of case scenario, not in a trauma patient. Um, but, you know, this is also um, with not without its limitations. Um, the FAST exam has poor sensitivity, variable positive predictive value, also things like the sonographer experience, um, the amount of fluid needed um, to be present for detection, the ability to differentiate between blood versus other fluids, and even um, normal anatomy can result in false positives. So if we hadn't taken, you know, the full picture, the full clinical setting into account um, and did not get the CT scan, um, the positive fast in this case could have been assumed to represent active bleeding, meaning she would have had to go back to the OR unnecessarily. Um, so the ag aggressive fluid resuscitation um, performed for this emergent hysterectomy um, combined with the increased capillary leakage from the DIC is what's suspected to have led to this false positive fast exam. So it likely represented extravagated fluid and old blood in her abdomen. Excellent, uh, Julie. That was a great presentation. Um, Melissa, I'm going to start with you. Any questions for Julie? No, Julie, that's really interesting case presentation you provided. Um, I think that many of us is, you know, when we are teaching fast, you know, our expectation is that if you see something that that's probably the, the reason why you should take someone to an operative setting or to act on. And I, I, I really am, uh, it's interesting to see that you've made that differentiation between active bleeding, extravasation in a patient with, uh, you know, high potential for TIC um, in the setting of uterine atony, um, but also using ultrasound then as an adjunct in combination with the clinical findings and suspected diagnosis is really the important take home point just as you've um, provided. Right. And um, the only other thing I guess we could have done was the lung sliding um, for maybe like pneumothorax, if that was suspected, like you guys had talked about on the presentation before last. So that would have been a, a good thing to do in addition to the TTE um, and the FAST exam. Harry, any uh, questions uh, for Julie? Julie, that was good. This is a good case. Thank I like you. your poster. You mentioned all the clinic good points in bold black is really good expertise expertise in the clinical content context are really important when we're dealing this and knowing the sensitivity and specificity of a particular test is really valuable because past has a low sensitivity so that's another thing the last question i have is did your fast findings correlate with the ct findings or did you have anything different um, nope, they did correlate. Um, so that's what we saw. We saw um, just fluid in the abdomen and weren't sure at that point if it was blood um, versus other fluid. Um, and they went ahead and got the CT scan before going to the OR. And it did show um, that there was blood around the patient's liver. But it, it wasn't an active bleed. Um, they're able to, to say how much um, is bleeding if there is active bleeding based on the CT the radiologist when they had talked to them and they said, no, this is does not look like it's active bleeding. And so I, like could, your, I like your concept of serial exams. That's what we need to do. And you did everything like a textbook. Right. Yes. Yeah. And they, they remain stable. So um, all of her symptoms um, were managed conservatively. Excellent. Mm -hmm.
Jan, any questions for Julie? Yeah, no, no. I mean, Harry, Harry you know, I mean, like the serial part in conjunction with everything. So it's fantastic, you know, like a, that's sort of like using it, you know, if you can worry about, you know, the lung, the, the lung sliding, you know, that, then that's good because you everything else, you know, you're in the 95th percentile. So now you worry about the other sort of like, what else could I have done? But you did, you did everything right. The serial opportunity, like you, 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 I mean, it's just so hard to get back to the scanner, you know, right. So this, year, this you just do at the bedside. Yeah, exactly. The sensitivity is low, 60 to 80% alone. But when you do the serial exams, um, it does increase the sensitivity. So we definitely saw that. Yeah. Steve? Sorry, I'll be quick. Um, no, I think this is a, a really exciting uh, clinical case because it demonstrates what happens when you take point of care ultrasound tools that were initially designed for one clinical setting and you move them into another clinical setting. So, so fast exam is a trauma tool initially for patients who you expect to show up in the, in the ER bay. And if there's blood, you, you treat it um, because it's probably from whatever penetrating trauma or blunt trauma they had. Um, but here we are in the perioperative setting where we're seeing uh, that there may be fluid in the abdomen for other reasons. So again, that's where getting a baseline in the PACU and following zero exams comes in into play and the notion that we we treat ultrasound, uh, sorry, we treat patients and not ultrasound images, right? So so you look at the clinical context, you look at what the how the patient's clinical state is evolving and you use that ultrasound to guide image, uh, guide, guide management. Uh, you don't use the imaging as the definitive uh, treatment plan. So, so I, I think this was a great case. Excellent. Thank you so much, Julie, for joining us. I really appreciate your time and uh, I'm glad you were able to share your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our, our next poster, um, we've got two people on. So uh, Steve, because you're going to be presenting the one after that, I'm going to hide you for just a few minutes here. You're not gone, just hidden. And I'm gonna get Sagar and Cornell on. Hey, how are you guys? Thanks for waiting. I know I saw you guys waiting in the wings this whole time. Cornell, your mic is muted, by the way. Thank you, I think it's good now. <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right, thank um, you for having us, guys. Yeah, so this is poster 1207, and I'm putting the link uh, for people into the notes here in the comments and uh let's get your poster up and i don't know how you guys want to coordinate uh, if one of you wants to present one part of it and the other um go for it but whoever is not speaking mute your mic so that it's a little bit easier for people to hear perfect i think Corey's going to start with the uh, presentation and then i'll take over halfway so i'll, I'll mute first and Corey will get started All right so uh, uh, my name's uh, Cornell Conca. I'm one of the anesthesia fellows at the uh, St. Francis Medical Center in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and I'll be starting us off here. Uh, our study was a, a retrospective analysis of um, the incidence of cardiac complications following total joint replacement surgery. Um, we focused in on the year uh, uh, 2018. Uh, preventing these complications after total joint surgery or any surgery really is of uh, significant importance to us because uh, they often lead to poor outcomes postoperatively and can place a heavy uh, burden on, on healthcare resources. Um, we as anesthesiologists uh, play a pivotal role um, in determining the risk of the, uh, the likelihood of these complications um, by uh, assessing and screening patients preoperatively and uh, hopefully only allowing patients who are appropriate uh, to actually proceed to uh, have their surgery. Um, however, de determining this preoperative risk can be uh, specifically challenging in the uh, total joint replacement population because they often, these patients often have um, debilitating pain and it's um, assessing their functional capacity can be limited uh, for that reason. Um, so oftentimes we rely on our uh, colleagues in cardiology to help uh, determine what their preoperative uh, risk is um, uh, using various techniques. Um, uh, as, uh, but still, it comes down to us and in the immediate sense to, to determine, you know, looking at the patient, oftentimes they look uh, different in person than they do on paper and uh, making a judgment of whether or not they should proceed the surgery. Um, and I think that uh, in the context of point of care ultrasound, um, our study may uh, have highlighted a patient population that could benefit from a bedside echocardiogram prior to their procedure, depending on what their workup was. Um, specifically, the objective of this study was to determine uh, uh, 
preoperative uh, screening, uh, whether or not it was accurately predicted the risk of the uh, cardiac complications after lower extremity joint replacement surgery, um, and took a look at the timing of these cardiac events um, as we head into an era of uh, more same-day total joint surgery. Um, so uh, our study uh, got underway after uh, our IRB approved the uh, methods. Um, we looked at the Connecticut Joint Replacement Institute's database um, and then identified patients um, using uh, ICD-10 uh, discharge codes, um, looking to see who within 90 days following their surgery, um, if anyone had uh, any angina, myocardial infarctions, congestive heart failure, exacerbations, uh, arrhythmias, or syncope. Um, once they were identified, Dr. Sitaria and I um, uh, looked at uh, the patients that were identified to sort of further determine what their preoperative workup had been um, and whether or not an appropriate evaluation uh, had been performed prior to their surgery. Um, and then I'll just present uh, some a little bit of the data here. If you look, um, uh, we identified, uh, the database identified 29 patients out of a little bit over 3,000 surgeries over the course of 2018 uh, that had developed some form of cardiac event. Um, the majority, in table one, you can see the majority of the patients were um, of an older population, the average age being 75. Um, and uh, you can see, I believe, in the next table, the uh, most common uh, exacerbate, uh, the most common cardiac event were um, CHF exacerbations. And with that, I'll leave it to you, Sagar. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, Sagar Satari, also a uh... Regional Acute Pain Fellow at uh, St. Francis Medical Center. Um, thank you, Dr. Conka, for, for getting started there. So as we look at the, the data here, a couple things that really stick out. Um, first and foremost, four out of our, uh, 14 out of our 29 patients, sorry, uh, the, the inciting cardiac, postoperative cardiac event happened um, for, within four days. So that's, that's pretty significant uh, in, in that, if we're trying to put this in the context of doing the 29, uh, the um, 23 hour stays and the same day joints, I think it's important to know that majority of these patients are having these complications in the immediate kind of post-operative setting. And four out of these 29 had them actually um, in, you know, either intraoperatively or in the PACU uh, post-op day zero. So uh, relatively soon after the surgery, um, we did find that um, of our, of all the data, we found that tachyarrhythmias and heart failure, like Corey had mentioned, were the most too common. And uh, again, taking this a step further to kind of put into context the point of care ultrasound, you know, this is where would we can use point of care ultrasound to further um, uh, either work up these patients postoperatively, uh, you know, in, in the meantime, while we're waiting for cardiology or, you know, medicine colleagues to see these patients, uh, we could definitely utilize point of care ultrasound to uh, assess volume status, uh, assess uh, global cardiac function, um, uh, you know, look for pneumothorax, look for possible PEs, all those type of things that could lead these patients to have some of these uh, adverse effects, adverse cardiac events. Um, furthermore, uh, you know, we, we did see about 38% of our patients, 11 out of the 29, um, were identified to be minimal to low risk. And then they did have uh, these cardiac postoperative cardiac complications, which is concerning. Granted, uh, we only looked at one year data, and this is kind of a, a smaller study, part of a bigger series of uh, data collection that we're looking to do. We have data for six or seven years, so you know, hopefully, we can kind of keep keep looking at that data. But thirty eight percent is still a relatively high number of patients who developed uh, cardiac complications, um, even though they were deemed low risk. And the overarching kind of uh, takeaway point of this is, uh, you know, as we look to proceed, um, as we look to proceed to these more and more of these same day joints or doing these same day joints in uh, freestanding ambulatory surgery centers, perhaps we should be looking to do a little bit more of a um, more of a you know, stricter risk stratification process and kind of one of the tools we can incorporate into that process, uh, as Corey mentioned, was using point of care ultrasound, despite the you know patients might may or may not have had preoperative um, echocardiograms or preoperative assessments. Uh, they come to our pre-op bay in the morning. It's really up to the anesthesiologist to determine whether or not this patient is um, 
a suitable candidate for surgery. And um, often, like Corey mentioned, pa patients look different on paper than they do in person. So I think that's where we could really tie in that uh, point of care ultrasound and really think we need to really make a more strict or guidelines as to who we approve for um, same-day joint replacement surgeries. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, Jan, I'm going to start with you um, with uh, questions about the use of point of care ultrasound in this purely uh, these cardiac concerns. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, important, very important always to get a baseline. So I think, you know, to get like the, you know, also the you know the 11 people that are unexpected if you think about that you know it's like 11 out of 3000 right it's not 11 out, you know so there is also a percent but it's certainly a high yield you know like if somebody has a history of chf so a preoperative echo is what i what i do you know because it, it affects induction man you know a, a lot of things and um, you know, probably people with CHF are probably not the best candidate for those outpatient joints to begin with, but I like the systematic approach. And I know that Sanjay has been at one of our ASRA focus courses. Um, so we're, we're, we're hoping to be able to, once all, all of this returns to a more social, sociable um, way of life that um, we 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 see both of you or, or many or, or some people online at these. But I think it's like it's so powerful. I mean, and I know in Boston the pediatric um, orthopedists um, do on every athlete a um, only one view because they're mainly concerned about um, Holcomb and LA dysfunction. But it's such an important trigger, and that's where a lot of concern always comes from. Is that are we gonna take our patients away? Like in that couple of posts back when they are presenting hypotension, this, these are patients that are not gonna be followed by a regional anesthesiologist, they're gonna be followed by a cardiologist. So I think it just improves patient care, but I really like the systematic approach you guys are taking. Taking how often, what is the stock? What is the high yield intervention? I, I thought that was fantastic. Melissa, you wanna follow up? Well, one of the things that got me thinking is number one, the data is quite alarming that this many people had cardiac events after uh, total joint arthroplasty. But also I think it just pushes us to, to really um, embrace um, the, the technology, the ultrasound technology that's portable because that can go into these outpatient surgery centers that are looking at same day joint replacement, but also our 24 hour short stays and having that readily available. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, n not having all those cardiology people ready uh, like we are at the big academic centers is n is a luxury not everybody has, whether it's outpatient surgery or uh, even some hospitals inpatient surgery. They're not going to have somebody readily available to jump uh, on that case and help you in a moment's notice. And the more skills we have to kind of at least do cursory assessments, we can triage people better. Um, Hari, you want to follow up with a question? You said all the cases are from lower extremity. Just an interesting thing. Is there any particular surgery, revision knees, revision hips? Which group had the highest complications? It was uh, total hip uh, replacements had the highest rate of complications. Um, I don't think that we identified any particular reason. That I don't think in our demographic there were any different, major differences in their um, comorbidities leading into the surgeries. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure why it was total hips. Recently, Stavros published a paper, I think, saying that outpatient minds are having more morbidity and mortality. So you were, that's the reason I we pulled your study, which is to look at the retrospective data. This is good. That's where we need to find and do something and help with the focus, especially as Melissa was telling in outpatient centers. Thank you. Thank you. And like I mentioned, well like I mentioned this is this is um, we have you know we have tons more data and this is just kind of a snapshot of it. So hopefully we'll be able to incorporate uh, all the other years of data, thousands and thousands of cases, and kind of see if these trends do stick, uh, you know, stay true amongst all those years. So, well, thank you guys, Steve. I'm going to cut you off here for the sake of time. So I want you to present the next poster, um, Sagar and Cornell. Thank you so much for uh, participating. I'm going to kick you guys off. Thank you for having here. us, guys. All right, let me take you guys off. We'll get Jan back up on here. 
and we're going to do Steve, you're going to present a poster too, uh, before we start talking about the COVID POCUS stuff. Um, this is uh, poster number 1199, and I'm putting the link in the comments, and we'll pop it up on the screen. Uh, titled Interior Quadratus Lumborum Block Does Not Provide Superior Pain Control Following Hip Arthroscopy. Take it away, Steve. Okay, so uh, just before I get started, I want to make sure I thank all my co-collaborators uh, who worked very hard to collect data. Um, it was a somewhat challenging study to coordinate with all the different elements. I want to particularly thank our first author, Audrey Singh, our research assistant who was running around like crazy um, for the last year and a half trying to get this done. Um, so, so even though this is uh, is really an ultrasound guided regional anesthesia study, um, it was inspired by a POCUS study that we performed at our institution that was published in ANA back in 2017, where we used uh, the FAST exam as a means to evaluate how often um, we would see intra-abdominal fluid extravasation happen in patients who are uh, receiving hip arthroscopy. And so historically, um, uh, Intra-abdominal fluid extravasation, uh, which is fluid tracking from the hip joint into the peritoneum during hip arthroscopy, um, based on retrospective data, happened about 0.14% of the time. And our study, um, we saw it happen 14% of the time. So it was a hundredfold increase in terms of how often we would see fluid extravasate from the hip into the peritoneum. And we found that those patients had greater change in their pain scores. So they were having a, a, a less comfortable experience postoperatively. And um, so when we published this data, um, we received a letter to the editor um, and uh, and uh, the, the um, recommendation uh, based on the letter editor was uh, perhaps we should consider doing quadratus lumborum blocks on these patients um, as they've seen some benefit for certain hip surgeries and it's been effective for abdominal and pelvic surgery and perhaps that would help treat some of the uh, uh, visceral symptoms that you might see with fluid extravasation into the peritoneum. Um, and so, and so uh, in addition to that, we've seen some retrospective studies that might suggest that this is an effective block for hip arthroscopy. So that inspired us to, to uh, um, put together this study. And uh, so what we did was we enrolled 96 patients that were randomized to either receive a, a standard uh, anesthetic and multimodal analgesia, which involved the spinal um, and intraoperative uh, IV acetaminophen and Ketorolac uh, versus receiving a, a transmuscular or QL3 or anterior, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, based on the nomenclature, uh, but a, Q, a quadratus lumborum block where you're injecting uh, the local between uh, the quadratus lumborum muscle and the psoas muscle. Um, so we injected 30 cc's of half percent uh, bupivacaine, and we did add a preservative free, two milligrams of preservative free dexamethasone. And, uh, and then we took a look at uh, primarily uh, pain scores at rest and movement um, at uh, 30 minutes, or so preoperatively 30 minutes minutes, one hour, two hours, three hours, and 24 hours uh, upon arrival in the recovery room. And if you take a look at table one, um, essentially what it demonstrates is that there was no major significant difference. Um, we saw that uh, there was a statistically significant difference for NRS pain score at rest 30 minutes after arrival at the PACU. Um, it's arguable uh, whether or not one uh, point really is clinically significant, but it was st statistically significant. Um, all the other times, there was no uh, significant difference. Um, uh, there was also uh, no difference in terms of 24-hour uh, opioids, uh, PACU antiemetics, and, and patient satisfaction. Um, what was helpful, uh, and I thought was a, a, a meaningful finding, was that we didn't notice any difference in quadricep. Uh, strength. So despite using a, a fairly robust dose of 0.5% bupivacaine, it was a motor sparing block. Um, so uh, this demonstrates essentially that as a preemptive block on healthy patients who at baseline didn't have a lot of pain, um, that it, it didn't really um, provide any significant benefit over a standard multimodal analgesia. Um, uh, now, what the point of care uh, element of this is that we also performed a fast exam on all these patients uh, preoperatively and postoperatively, and uh, and we looked for the incidence of intra-abdominal fluid extravasation. And um, as you can see, it was uh, even higher than what we saw before. Um, uh, we're in the 20% range while well before we saw it at, at about 14%. Um, and, and I think that possibly may be due to the fact that we're just getting a better detecting um, fluid uh, now uh, than we were before. We're also using slightly different equipment. Um, uh, so uh, 
one of the things that we did look at, um, although we weren't necessarily powered to look at this, was whether or not there was a difference in between the groups of uh, whether or not they received a QL, uh, quadrate slumborn block, or control um, if intra-abdominal fluid extravasation was present. And we did not see a difference um, in terms of their pain scores either. So, so the quadrate slumborn block did not provide a benefit for the patients that had intra-abdominal fluid extravasation. I'm still muted. Hang on. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. I don't know why my video is frozen, but we'll get mm -hmm. that back on. I'll get that sorted out in a second. So um, I'm going to pass on a question from Nabil. He said, uh, one, did you guys report on intraoperative opioids? And two, was uh, what was the exact nature of the arthroscopy? Was there bony work or just labrum repair? So there was a variety of, of uh, um, cases that were done uh, from just a standard sort of labral repair and, and femoral osteotomy to, uh, you know, there were some psoas release. Uh, it, as was the case in our, in our previous um, uh, study, there was no difference in terms of intra-abdominal fluid extravasation. Um, we also didn't really see uh, significant difference in terms of um, overall pain uh, between those groups. Uh, with 96 patients, it's really difficult to differentiate between surgical procedure and and uh, and pain score. Um, but uh, and, and particularly with uh, uh, looking at a complication like intra-abdominal fluid extravasation. Um, but uh, but uh, we didn't really see a, a big difference in terms of the, the actual operation that was performed. Uh, we did look at intraoperative opioids. Um, uh, all patients received a, a small dose of fentanyl at the start of the case. Um, and then uh, for patients that were having uh, pain or appeared to have pain at the end of the case, they were able to receive up to one milligram of dilaudid and that was, that was taken into consideration. Jan, you have a question for Steve? Yeah, no, I mean, of course we're, like, we're, we're, we're sad that, you know, so there was like no helpful findings in terms of um, it's helpful for things to be negative sometimes. Yes. Well, well, yes. I mean, I think it's really important. I think it's great, but you know, it was like you know, the, the QL blog did not help. Um, did you find a difference? But I think it sounds like you did it for intraoperative use of opioids. And did you find so like what? So what is like the next step? I think the ultimately it's sort of like the hip is complex, and do we have two? Ultimately, I think and there's a question, we we'll probably agree on that as we agree on a lot, is do we have two different pain drivers, the hip and the abdominal pain and hip arthroscopies? Um, yeah, I, there wasn't a, a, a very, well, there wasn't a statistically significant difference in terms of intraoperative opioid use between the two groups. Um, now I can tell you anecdotally, um, I, I don't think there was much of a difference in terms of, you know, sometimes you'll see if patients get the QL block, um, they can last a little bit longer than someone who just has a standard spinal. Um, I don't think that happened significantly more. Uh, I do think one of the uh, issues with looking at um, the QL block for treating intra-abdominal fluid extravasation is that the QL block is a, is a unilateral block. Um, um, and if fluid extravasates into the peritoneum, then that is going to irritate uh, the peritoneum uh, bilaterally. So, so you really have to do sort of a bilateral block in order to, to really um, make sure that you're, you're covering that as, as a source of, of the pain. Um, so uh, so I, I, I will also say anecdotally, um, although we haven't studied it explicitly, that uh, this is a, a fairly effective block um, as a rescue block. Uh, so if your pain is 12 out of 10 and you get it down to, you know, a six or a seven, then, then it looks pretty effective. But if you do it preemptively on someone who's at low pain score at baseline and postoperatively, they just had surgery and hip scopes hurt, uh, then it, it doesn't really look like it's that effective. Hari, any questions for Steve on this one? Uh, I don't know where you are on the QL argument uh, about whether it's covering <laughs> visceral pain or not, but... Um, no, no, I was just about to ask the same question because Steve presented a case report, QL is working, and now his results came back. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to ask. So do you think the QL works, huh, Steve? Sorry? Do you think the QL works at all? I, I've used it as a rescue. I've, I've used it as a rescue block, and I and it's and it's been effective. Um, you know, it doesn't make the pain go to zero. It's not 
like doing a brachial plexus block. And and as Jan mentioned, the innervation to the hip is complicated. Um, yeah. uh, and then you're taking into consideration that there might be a peritoneal element to it as well. So. Um, uh, it's yeah, it's 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 definitely no magic bullet. Yeah, Melissa, any thoughts uh, before we wrap up this last poster? Uh, I know you didn't remark on it, Stephen, but was there any concerns about interoperative hypotension or hemodynamic instability for those that received the block versus those that were on the standard multimodal? We did not see that, um, and we're doing a relatively low lumbar block. Uh, so we didn't we didn't see that there was any significant threat to uh, spread to uh, this notion of the the you know potential lumbar pervertebral um, uh, space and hemodynamic changes. Yeah, we we did we didn't see that with thirty cc's um, unilaterally. No. So we're gonna do a quick little shift here. Normally, I do the introduction with saying that we're not going to talk about COVID nineteen during this session and give everybody a break from it. I didn't do that today because we actually are going to talk a little bit about COVID nineteen. Um, for the, the authors that presented their poster that are still sitting in our deck, you guys are welcome to stay, but if you have other things to do too, uh, <coughs> I, I, I completely understand you're welcome to walk away as well, uh, or continue watching, um, separately online. Either way is fine with me. Um, and, uh, I, Harry, are you starting or is Steve starting with this, um, uh, present? Who's starting with this one? I think, am I, am I starting Harry? Right, yeah. Yeah, his mic was muted. I couldn't tell what he was saying. Um, yes, yes. Okay, so this one, we're just talking a little bit about um, the use of point-of-care ultrasound. There's been a lot of talk on social media and some other information that's been published out there on the value of point-of-care ultrasound in the assessment of patients with COVID-19. So we thought this would be a good opportunity with these very, very smart people who know about point-of-care ultrasound, which I am not one of them, um, to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that could be useful if you're dealing with patients uh, with this illness. So Steve, you want to take it away and we'll get, uh, you just tell me when to advance and we can move sure. to slides. Uh, sure. So I, I just want to um, think it's helpful for us to discuss this topic since obviously it's very relevant and something that I think a lot of us um, will be thinking about and potentially dealing with. Um, um, if we haven't so already um, as our sort of adjunct roles as ICU physicians during this this COVID crisis. Um, but uh, when it comes to, to, to the use of POCUS for COVID-19, it actually um, was highlighted fairly early on in, in the literature. Um, there was a publication that came out of intensive care medicine. If you're in the uh, Azure POCUS SIG, uh, we highlighted it in our last uh, newsletter, but the Chinese critical care ultrasound uh, study group uh, published the role of lung ultrasound in COVID-19 and, and specifically sort of the most common findings with some of the patients that had that had COVID-19. Um, and uh, and that was published uh, on March 12th. It's been cited almost 60 times since then. Um, so it's clear that there's, uh, there's a lot of publications, a lot of interest in the role of POCUS uh, for a variety of reasons. And there are also a lot of great online resources that are available. Um, so this is going to be sort of a, a snapshot. Um, we're going to keep it relatively simple. Um, I, I, I did find a, a very helpful online resource. Um, it was very succinct uh, uh, through medcram.com. Uh, they had a YouTube video with uh, Dr. Joshua uh, Jacquet, um, and, uh, and he really did a great job of deep diving into uh, the use of lung ultrasound uh, for COVID-19. So I, I wanted to put that out there if you wanted a, a good 40-minute synopsis of, of uh, all the things to look for. Um, so we'll advance to the next slide. So, as I mentioned, there's been a, a lot of publications that have come out um, regarding uh, POCUS and COVID-19, and, and one of the most recent ones uh, was published by uh, the American Society of Echocardiography, the ASC. Uh, and so they highlighted uh, multiple uh, different uses for, uh, for point of care for COVID, not just cardiac, um, which you think sort of would be uh, in their wheelhouse, um, but also the use uh, for lung ultrasound and for vascular. And so I'm going to go over some of the findings for lung ultrasound sound and then Hari is going to uh, touch on cardiac and vascular um, and so uh, this is a this is a nice summary chart um, and and uh, you know I think the the main thing that we see here uh, is that when you're performing a lung ultrasound exam as you can see under sort of structure and lung um, they mentioned this 12 point exam um, now 
really what they what they mean by that is you need to do a, a comprehensive lung exam because what you're going to see uh, in someone who has a viral pneumonia um, uh, instead of someone who may have uh, CHF or ARDS is that it's it's often a, a focal or multifocal. So you're going to see it in very specific locations and, and it's not a diffuse presentation. So you really do need to scan sort of broadly um, and they often describe doing this sweeping sort of lawnmower type scanning where you start from one side and work your way back and forth and back and forth to make sure that you evaluate uh, the full lung and you're assessing the pleura and you're looking for things like A lines and B lines with B lines being uh, sort of the most common indicator that, that you have uh, an interstitial process going on uh, and that might indicate a pneumonia. Um, now, when you see uh, things like um, uh, consolidations, then then that causes there to be this irregularity in the pleura, this pleural thickening, and often you see uh, 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 these sort of hypoechoic uh, signs of the uh, regular pleura, um, and uh, and so that's that's where uh, where you can use it to to sort of go one step further from just B lines, like there's an interstitial process to consolidations. And then finally, pleural effusions are something that you can evaluate for as well, um, although they're they're um, based on most of the data out there, it's it's fairly uncommon to see a large pleural effusion. You may see a small effusion um, at either the base of the lungs or or you may see it um, where you see these consolidations. Uh, so we'll move on to the next slide. And so, uh, Again, we, we see here B lines are our main thing that we're going to be evaluating. Um, and so uh, focal versus diffuse, uh, that's one way to help you differentiate when a patient comes in the door. Um, nowadays, if a patient comes in and has uh, pulmonary symptoms, I think COVID-19 is at the very top of our differential diagnosis, um, but it is possible that they may have something else like congestive heart failure um, uh, as, as a, and that's the source of their, of their respiratory distress. And so we wanna keep in mind that the difference between someone who has a CHF type picture where, where you see diffuse B lines um, uh, versus a viral type pneumonia is it's going to be focal or multifocal. Um, so it's you see these sort of consolidations in certain areas or, or uh, multiple different areas. Um, these small subpleural consolidations, that's where you'll see the, the lung thickening, uh, the pleural thickening um, in addition to B lines uh, and, uh, and these irregularities where, where you see sort of the pleural line. Um, uh, have these hypoechoic um, uh, uh, sort of small fluid collections in between the pleura uh, that that usually suggests that you you have a consolidation. As we move into the more worrisome territory, um, where where you see uh, hepatitization of the lung, uh, where you have um, significant uh, uh, consolidations, air bronchograms, um, uh, that's where that's where the patients uh, move into the uh, potential ICU ARDS type of setting. Um, so generally speaking, you're looking for B lines. They're not going to be diffuse. Uh, uh, and they're most commonly at the base of the lungs. So move on to the next one. And, and so this is a, a nice summary um, from uh, anesthesia. Uh, again, looking at where you see a fully aerated sort of happy lung, where you see A lines um, uh, that, are, that are prominent and you're not seeing any, any B lines. And as you move uh, to uh, uh, more of an interstitial process um, from the viral pneumonia, you see a prevalence of these B lines uh, you see here the pleura is sort of brighter and thickened, um, which suggests irritation of the pleura. Um, as you move into a, a, a consolidation type of picture, um, then again, the, the lung starts to look like the liver. That's the hepatic, hepatitization, and, and you may see a fusion. So, so uh, um, why is this a benefit to us? Uh, well, I think there are a variety of reasons why lung ultrasound is helpful. Uh, if you're evaluating a COVID patient, obviously, uh, you know, unless we're working in the emergency room, we're not all often on the front lines, but it does help us triage when it comes to assessing which patients um, may be at high risk uh, uh, for moving in the wrong direction and decompensating versus ones that may uh, be able to be stable at home or be stable on a regular floor and not need to go to an ICU. And so uh, the Butterfly IQ actually put out um, uh, through Mike Stone uh, a recommendations on how to potentially use lung ultrasound to triage patients. Um, so for example, if you have a patient who has no supplementary uh, O2 requirements and has just A lines as you'd see on the left 
uh, upper left hand of the screen, and that's someone who uh, most likely is is low risk for uh, acute decompensation and and should probably quarantine at home. Um, alternatively, if you're not requiring oxygen and you have uh, some some focal B lines, uh, again, that also may be someone who may be uh, able to stay at home. Um, once you require supplemental oxygen and you start moving into the category of, of seeing uh, these uh, these diffuse B lines, uh, uh, coalescence of the B lines, which means that you're not seeing any any uh, darkness in between. It. Essentially, the entire lung uh, looks uh, looks like a waterfall, as it's been described. Um, uh, uh, or you're seeing uh, pleural thickening, significant pleural thickening. Um, then that may be the obvious indication that a patient needs to be hospitalized. And and once you move into the consolidation territory, that means you know you're approaching more of an ARDS phenomenon, and and you might want to consider. Um, I, I see ICU status. So, so, uh, so this can help guide ICU decision making. Um, it can help uh, uh, sort of determine which patients really, you know, need to be admitted to the hospital or stay home. Uh, it allows you to risk stratus stratify um, which patients are at low or high risk for potentially um, uh, advancing in terms of their disease and requiring further intervention. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that uh, obviously. Uh, there are resource limitations in terms of getting testing. Um, and so uh, if you're in a situation where you're unable to get tested, this could be a way to potentially confirm uh, COVID-19. Um, I'm going to tell you, I, I had it. Uh, I had COVID-19 a few weeks ago. Um, and you know, I had some fevers and some body aches, uh, a little bit of a cough um, for the first few days. And I scanned my lungs pretty routinely and they looked okay. And then day five, I saw B lines and pleural thickening and a small pleural effusion. And I wasn't able to get tested because in New York it's just impossible to get tested. Um, but it was very clear to me that I that I had it. Um, you know, it was a little scary, but I, <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm fine now. Um, and those have all gone back to their baseline, um, which is uh, which is I, I have lots of happy A lines and, and no effusion anymore. And and so not only can it help you sort of potentially diagnose the, the disease um, when you don't have the resources to, to get the PCR testing done, but it allows you to follow the progression of the disease and aid management in an ICU for uh, lung recruitment maneuvers or uh, assessing whether or not prone positioning is, is helping in terms of uh, decreasing these consolidations um, uh, and potentially even aid in, in prognosis. Um, and that's where some of the cardiac uh, ultrasound scanning also comes into play um, when you take the full picture into consideration. Um, uh, in the end, it's always a matter of, uh, you know, risk versus benefit um, when it comes to the use of ultrasound uh, or any sort of clinical tool. I would say that uh, the risk um, of this is obviously we're carrying a device into the room, we're physically going into the room that we could, if, we, if it's not adequately cleaned, um, and decontaminated could potentially uh, contaminate other patients. So you want to use uh, very rigorous, um, you know, donning and doffing and decontamination of, of your equipment. That's where these smaller ultrasound, handheld ultrasounds come into play because they're much easier to move around and, and can be uh, cleaned uh, a lot more, uh, I'd say, effectively and probably efficiently than, than the larger machines. Um, the benefit, it's cheap, uh, it's fast, we can't get routine uh, CT scans on these patients, so uh, so we're you know it's it's definitely a benefit for us to be able to to do this quickly to uh, again look at progression of of disease and and finally I you know I think it, the benefit is that it's it is very accurate um, in, in many ways uh, ultrasound lung ultrasound is more accurate than than uh, your chest X ray or even your CT scan um, in terms of showing uh, significant disease so so uh, that is a uh, that is my summary of lung ultrasound for COVID. It's again, very broad, but there are a lot of other great resources out there um, that I highly recommend. Again, I'm going to uh, highlight uh, medcram.com, uh, their video I found very helpful. Steve, I had no idea that you had COVID-19. I've been seeing a lot of other stories of people kind of who have point of care ultrasound skills assessing themselves during the course of their illness online. I didn't realize you had it. I'm glad you're feeling better. Yeah. Um, it, it's it, nice to have an ultrasound at home. <laughs> yeah, something weird about the fact that you can get an ultrasound, but you can't get a test. That's I'm still having a cognitive dissonance with that, but no. we'll leave that where it is. Uh, Harry, I'm guessing you're on the next slide here, so why don't you take it away? Uh, thank you, Stephen. I will be covering the cardiac and the vascular part. So this is another important area we need to look at uh, along with the lungs. So the, basically, the cardiac 
focus is no different what you do routinely do in a covid patient you just do the same stuff but you think of more common things more common in the covid po population so look at the lv look at the rv looking at the pericardium these are the three most important things and a little bit about the walls so the common entities that are encountered in these patients are myocarditis and looking for the global lv function that's the most common reported incidences highest incidence in this covid patients is myocarditis and they are also prone for thrombotic events so they are developing these acute coronary syndromes so they named it as a fancy name called corona syndromes and looking at uh, failures cardiomyopathies and as they looking as an entity of focus see what you want quick scan come out and in the vascular part again look at the ivc and i added a vexa scan it is very advanced to the icu not for routine general population to look at the volume status looking at the ivc portal vein renal vein and other stuff and the last as i said because of the thrombotic events we need to look at the veins lower extremity veins to rule out dvt in patients who are chronically ventilated or in the icu these are the three entities we need to cover next slide raj so as i said it's no different from the normal thing so i usually use the basic fate views the four views pretty much very reasonable to do a focus in a covid 19 patient so basically then we should question ourselves why are we doing what are the reasons we need to do so the main aim is to detect any pre existing cardiovascular disease or to see if there is any worsening of the previous existing disease or anything new that is due to the covid 19 and monitor the changes in the cardiac function as i said specifically look for myocarditis global or lv systolic function looking for pericardial effusion looking for the rv that is the most common or important thing that when the patients are being ventilated a hypoxia looking into the rv looking at the pulmonary pressures pulmonary hypertension and maybe into the pe aspects as well so those are the things to look and specifically because of the corona syndrome look at looking at the regional wall motion abnormalities next one raj as i said like i used the common four views the first the top left is the parasternal long axis view so that view gives a good idea and you can see the mitral septal separation look at the lv function looking at the opening of the walls so that's a standard view to start your uh, focus then move on to the parasternal short axis on the left side top corner right side so this is the one of the key views if you want one view to look at the function lv systolic function this is the good view to get look at the lv look at the rv look compare the sizes and this is the one view where you can compare the walls to for the regional wall motion abnormalities so i highly recommend using the short axis view to assess the global function then move over to the left lower end apical four chamber view so there you can see all the four chambers you can see the tricuspid regurg you can estimate your pressures you can do your mapc you can do your tapc and you can again assess your wall motion abnormalities in this view then if you don't get any of the transthoracic views so the subcostal view sometimes may be the only answer especially in copd patients with a hypoxic the subcostal view may be the only option and this is called the subcostal four chamber view where you see again all the four chambers measure the r rv thickness and gives you an idea of everything next one so coming that's the most important thing in the focus so look for the myocarditis look for the regional wall motion abnormalities look for the function so the challenge when you are doing the cardiac focus sometimes in this covid situations is patients might be prone so the asc had a good image where i didn't put all the stuff here how to do or getting the expertise in the prone positioning so that is the only challenge may be encountered but nothing no different carry on with the standard four views and add your ivc view when coming to the vascular assessment to look at the ivc collapsibility and the diameter that gives you an idea about the fluid status then if you think the flu patient is overloaded based on the ivc assessment you can move on to the next what is called vexes venous 
excess ultrasound scan where you assess the IVC, portal vein, hepatic vein, and renal vein. So they assess all four, three, and they give a scoring called VEXA score that is commonly done by the intensivists, and they, that's how they conclude whether the patient is overloaded with fluids or not. As the incidence of DVT is very high, thrombotic events, so this is another thing to scan the lower extremity veins, starting from the common femoral, going up to the, to the popliteal vein. They mentioned is a five-point scan and looking at all these parts and to, to rule out the DVT. So coming to the cardiovascular, I would say do the good focus of the heart using the standard four views, look at the IVC, and if uh, another things, do, do the DVT. If you are very, very advanced, look at the vexes. Thank you, Raj. So that's what I can say. You will be. You need to use it. It is becoming a common gadget. You get all the five stars, and you don't want to cry because you didn't use your focus skill. <laughs> that, that that's a uh, well. I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, th thank you so much. Um, I, you know, we we crammed in a lot into this session. There were a couple of other posters we're going to talk about, but I'll leave the links in the comments uh, for the sake of time. Um, I, I really want to thank all the authors that came on and took time out to present their work. Um, you know, all of us felt bad that you didn't have an opportunity to present it at the meeting itself. But, you know, with an audience of uh, somewhere between 500 to 1,000 people watching these videos, it's probably more than you get at a moderated poster session. So it may uh, actually come out better in the end and actually getting more exposure for your work. And I want to thank you guys for talking about point of care ultrasound, um, not just in the context of what was at the meeting, but in the context of everybody's life nowadays uh, dealing with coronavirus. And I think there's a lot that we're going to learn from this, hopefully, uh, and initiate coming out of this on the other end. And uh, we'll do things better uh, than we did before so that there's something that's good that comes out of this. Any last thoughts or comments before we wrap it up today? Um, one thing that was mentioned in the live comments, uh, thank you, Hari, uh, for, for uh, pointing that out. Um, USABCD dot org has made oh, their yes. lung ultrasound module uh, available for free um during this time so uh it's it ends at the d <laughs> um oh, but there's uh, no yeah. e there. okay so <laughs> there's no e. the diaphragm yeah. here we go uh, yeah um but uh but uh yeah so so that's a that's a helpful resource it, i don't think they have a module specifically on covid 19 so if you want to look at the findings specifically for that you may need to supplement it but it does at least give you the fundamentals for for lung ultrasound um for cardiac, I just wanted to say, you know, because uh, this is such a prothrombotic uh, disease, um, really, you know, looking for PEs, looking for uh, or propagation of clot and, and regional wall, mo wall motion abnormalities um, uh, is incredibly important as it, when it comes to to determining whether or not you know uh, patients, you know, what, what's their prognosis. If it's one thing, if their lungs are knocked out, it's another thing if if you've, you cause a significant, uh, you know. Uh, either viral uh, myocarditis or, or they've had a, a significant cardiac event as a result of it, so. One last little plug. Um, Azra is having a webinar this Wednesday um, talking about uh, life after COVID. So this is clinical practice in the post-COVID uh, era. And uh, you have to register on the website. So if you see the link I've got at the bottom there, um, and I'll put it in the comments too, you can go to that link and register um, for the webinar. I'll be presenting part of the topic there, but we've got several faculty that are going to be talking about different components about how to get your practice back into function uh, in the post-COVID era. And we're going to talk a little bit about ORs, but also about pain clinics. So for those of you guys that are interested, this is the last day I'm going to do the poster moderated sessions, but I will be continuing to do live streams intermittently as time allows. So keep up and, um, and uh, I would love to get other people involved with this and uh, joining the conversation, just talking about what they're doing in their own careers and their own practices. And um, hopefully we can keep the conversation going as time goes on so that we don't feel so socially distant, even though we're physically distant while we're dealing with coronavirus. Um, but thank you all of you for joining. I know this has been a long session, but uh, I really enjoyed it. I hope you guys did too. And um, I'll see you again soon in person, hopefully. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Raj. Stay, Raj. Right.